I, uh, I feel like I'm uh, preaching to the uh, choir for sure here when I think about the great work that you all are doing in this wonderful state. And I think about Governor Dalrymple and his leadership. Your delegation in Washington is fantastic. The senators, in fact, you know, we're a regional company. I mean, we operate most of our businesses in Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi and then the panhandle of Florida. And we have competitive generation businesses in Texas and New Mexico and Nevada and California and the Carolinas and deep in Florida. But we really pride ourselves on having a national reach. And so it's our business, I think, to try and influence policy across the United States. So I've had the, the, the privilege to call on your senators, Hoven and Heitkamp, and they are terrific. They represent you well. They represent the state, but they also represent the interests of America. And when you consider the influence you now have with uh, Commissioner Tony Clark, it's so important for America to be able to put your fingerprints on our future energy policy. I get pretty passionate about this. It's just incredible to me kind of where we are as a nation, where we are kind of around the globe. You know that we've been in this global malaise. We have all this strife in the Middle East and everything else. And, and here at home, I mean, how did we get to where we are? I was just on a phone call with members of the Business Roundtable, but we were talking with President Obama and Secretary Liu, he's the Treasury Secretary, and Valerie, Valerie Jarrett was kind of hosting the call, and we were trying to figure out what does all this mean? How long can we continue to have this government shut down, and what's it going to do to the economy? And what happens, heaven forbid, should the United States default on its debt? I just find that astounding that we're having that conversation today, and yet we are. And frankly, I think Americans are sick of it. And I, I am so struck with the notion sometimes that there's so much negative stuff going on right now, unnecessarily. And I think that Americans are thirsting for a way to play offense in this challenged environment. And I think the kind of work you're doing here in North Dakota the kind of national energy security policy I've been promoting on a number of fronts. I did just as recently as, I guess I was on Squawk Box last Thursday morning. We've got to get this right. I think this is a way forward. Now, we know that Congress is completely frozen, and we've got to find a way to break that logjam. I was just on a panel again about a week ago with... Um, with um, Senator Murkowski from Alaska, Senator Manchin from West Virginia, so there's a Republican and a Democrat. And I was up there, and we were talking about this stuff. My sense is we can find bipartisan support for the kind of the things that you're showing national leadership for. But we've got to get the message mobilized. We've got to get this story out. This is not just a North Dakotan story. You are leading the way. This has to be an American story. See, I am always struck with the notion that, and, and he told you about my role at the Federal Reserve Bank. You know, here we are, we're stuck on fiscal policy. We can't get anything going out of Washington. So what are we trying to do to improve this malaise that we're in, this unacceptably high unemployment and slow economic growth? Well, I think we can find a way. There's monetary policy going on right now, and some would argue that the Fed is doing too much. But heaven forbid, where would we be without them right now? You saw how the market reacted just to these even signals of tapering. What will happen whenever we start to get the ship righted? It would be fascinating. And I would enjoy, at the end of this conversation right now, any of your questions to kind of engage on some of these other issues. But for all the difficulties we're having at a national policy level, I am always brought back home, and I guess we always, at the end of the day, have our parochial interests. And mine are to represent the families that we have the privilege to serve in the Southeast. We are one of the largest energy companies in America. And in fact, if you just look at an energy production standpoint, if you want to dimension Southern Company, 
We're similar in size, but a little bit smaller than the nation of Australia. We're a big company. But here's what's big to me. 48% of the families we're privileged to serve make less than $40,000 a year. Now, I know with your economic growth, you've really improved that profile. And I wish, you know, you have that chart, Governor, where you show North Dakota and the rest of America. Man, that's a flag anybody can march under, isn't it? And how much have you improved the lives of the folks you serve? See, when I think about those families, those families make tough, kitchen table, economic decisions every day. And especially with respect to energy, their energy budget is relatively inflexible. They want to have the lights on, they want to be cool in the summer and warm in the winter. And when we see policies from Washington, not only they can't help those folks, but may burden their ability to feed their kids better, to live in a better place, to educate their kids better, to get better medical care. Well, I think that's a crime. And I think it's important for folks like us, the leaders of whatever enterprise you represent, to take a national stance, to show the rest of America the way forward to improve these folks' lives. And I'm so proud to represent the energy industry to where I think we can do that. Now, I do it Southern Company. Of course, I got to represent my own customers first and my shareholders second. I have a leadership role in the uh, electric utility industry. I'm vice chair of EEI, the Edison Electric Institute. I'm on the energy group. In fact, I co-chair the North American energy security effort at the Business Roundtable. But I can assure you we go everywhere that we can go. And that's why I was so delighted to come here to pitch the idea of North American energy security, because I think this is a way forward. This is a way to play offense. People in America are tired of being battered with bad news. They're frustrated with the frozen politics that we have in Washington. See, Governor, I think you're dead on. I think if we do the right stuff here in the United States, it is easy for me to see the energy complex being oil, natural gas, coal, and electricity is a particularly important part of that energy complex because as a consuming entity, electricity growth is growing five times the rate of any other energy resource. Now, we consume a lot of gas, consume a lot of coal. If we get this right, and I'm kind of, I, I was laughing at your, uh, you, you did your goal by 2025, 13 years early or whatever. Holy smokes, if my board ever heard that, that would be awful. I would keep that a secret. But seriously, I think what we can do for the United States is be a, I don't use the word energy independence, I use energy security, because I think we will always trade, frankly, with countries that aren't always friendly to us. That's kind of another conversation for another time. But I think we can be a net energy exporter by 2020. And perhaps with the kind of progress you've made here and the kind of progress America could make, if we had the will and the courage, I think America might even beat that. And I think we can be the largest producer of energy on the planet by 2030. Estimates for the value of that have been huge. And you said it, it's geopolitics. The phrase I like to use with folks when I talk about this is energy security breeds national security, breeds economic security. And for all this low growth we have and unacceptably high unemployment, we can change the game. I think we can add, you know, Citigroup estimates something like by 2020, 2% addition to GDP growth. We can add 2 million more jobs and by 2030, maybe 5 million more jobs. And that's what we got to be about. You know, at the end of the day, we all have our parochial interests. We got to serve that. I get that. I got shareholders. But at the end of the day, we're about leaving this nation stronger and better for our children. And we have the ability to do that if we get it right. See, I'm afraid there are people out there that want to dumb down American aspirations. I think we can reject that. And I think we can show the way. 
And so I think if we harness the ability to get this North American energy security idea together, to harness the potential for economic growth and job growth, to create an unassailable advantage for manufacturing in America, we're seeing that starting in the Southeast, creating more jobs, more personal income growth, a better life for Americans. What an aspiration that is. You're doing it here in North Dakota. And when you think about the problems and challenges you're facing now with growth, don't you know that the rest of America would love to have your problems? So good for you, but it's not enough to talk about North Dakota. We've got to get this going for America. You can help lead the way. Now, as chairman of Southern, in my role in the electric utility industry, and because electricity is growing at about five times the rate of any other energy consuming resource, I really focus on electricity policy as part of that kind of national energy security plan. And when I do, I generally talk about kind of uh, three major threads, three major strategies that we've got to pursue. These will seem familiar to you, but on the national stage, it's kind of interesting how they are and are not uh, being fulfilled. The first one is to promote the full portfolio. Well, some years ago when I first got this job, I ran around talking about all the arrows in the quiver. Uh, I thought it was a great phrase. Frank Luntz didn't particularly like it. Uh, and President Obama came out with this idea of all of the above. Well, that kind of usurped my arrows in the quiver. But whatever you call it, it's the full portfolio, it's, it's, it's natural gas, it's renewables, it's energy efficiency, it's coal and nuclear. We've got to get all that right. So the first thing I'll talk about is the full portfolio and what we need to do to make that a reality. The second major thrust of an electricity policy within the broader national energy plan is we've got to have a rebirth, a national imperative on energy innovation. When you think about what we've done in IT and everything else, you know, I, I grew up in the days of mainframe computers and we had the goofy card decks. Remember, you used to feed those things in there. And then we went to PCs, personal computers, and I could never conceive why anybody would need other, other than a, 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 a monitor that had orange on it, you know? Remember that? And now we have all this Facebook and Google and everything that my 24-year-old son knows that I don't. And think about how much economic value we've created on IT innovation. Why can't we do that with energy? Well, you're seeing it here in North Dakota with directional drilling. That is really an industry that has just rebirthed on the basis of technology innovation. We've got to think about that one as a national imperative. We haven't adopted that yet. And then the third may sound a little highfalutin to you but it is just as serious as any other issue we can address. And that is we've got to restore America's financial integrity. Having the political brinksmanship that we're seeing right now does not add to that. I'll talk about that in just a minute. So those are the three topics, right? The full portfolio, energy innovation, and then America's national, uh, I mean, uh, America's financial integrity. Let me go through the portfolio real quick. You guys get this. So again, I'm preaching to the choir. But there are some important issues that I think we have to just get on the table and deal with them. Let's start with natural gas. Now, I guess a little over a year ago, if you guys get the uh, weekend Wall Street Journal, uh, they do a weekend interview. They did that with me, again, about a year ago. And unfortunately, it was titled The Natural Gas Skeptic. I am no skeptic on natural gas, and I'll explain that in a minute. In fact, Southern Company used to be known as a coal company. Six years ago, we produced 70% of that energy from coal. What we have done in six years have moved from 70% energy from coal now to about 35% from coal. So we've cut it in half. And we've gone from 16% energy from natural gas now to about 45 to 47. So this giant aircraft carrier of a company, I don't know what it is today, $37 billion in market cap, we have turned it in a hurry. Don't let anybody tell you you can't make dramatic change in a short amount of time. You're proof of that. Southern Company's proof of that. 
I think the blessing of natural gas and directional drilling, which has been able to access in a commercial way stores of energy that has otherwise been unavailable, gives us a national advantage in a worldwide economy. And we've got to foster that great blessing. It is not, however, a panacea. So we've already made this big bet. I love natural gas. It's huge. It is important. It is a dominant solution to America's future. There are five things that we're going to have to deal with in terms of promoting natural gas broadly across the United States. And we can cover these in more detail if you want to later in the Q&A period. But number one is we've got to resolve successfully the fracking issue. If we don't, we're going to have environmental attacks on this for a long time to come. Number two, we've got to build out the infrastructure. You're struggling a little bit with that now. It's growing so fast, the unconventional finds of natural gas aren't where the old ones were. We need more pipes. There is now an increasing tension between manufacturing America and companies like ours that consume it for energy. We've got to make sure that we have firm transportation within those pipes. We've got to expand our storage across America. Number three is exporting. Now, it's funny, I gave the keynote address at the Energy Information Administration, and they couldn't believe I said this. Southern Company 100% supports exporting natural gas in America. And you may say, well, son of a gun, what are you smoking? Because isn't that going to raise prices? And here's the deal. If America is able to take its resources and as good capitalists sell them to whatever market will support them, we might have some short-term disruptions in price and volatility, but in the long run, I believe that America, especially the natural gas producers, will find prices that will sustain a level of activity. I want the level of activity to be as high as it possibly can be. And I want to accept as a consequence the burdens of, and I'm kidding here, an improved economy, more jobs, personal income, growth, manufacturing, the whole bit. I think the economy stands to gain by us exporting. And I think price will find its way whether we export or not. So we've got to figure out a way to get that going. Number four is this whole issue of demand curve shift. Look, like I say, natural gas is a dominant solution for America. We're seeing more and more manufacturing now taking advantage of it, right? Resurgence in chemicals and plastics. And anybody that used natural gas as a manufacturing input, terrific, good stuff. Transportation, you may have heard about the Pickens plan, whether you believe that or not. We need to use natural gas as a transportation fuel. And you think about my own industry. Let me just give you a dumb statistic. In 2011, last statistic I have, I ought to get this updated for 12, but in 2011, the United States consumed about 67 BCF per day of natural gas. Of course, it was volatile, and that's billions of cubic feet. There are plenty of estimates out there that say by 2020, cons considering manufacturing appetite, transportation penetration, energy production from my industry, you could be over 100 BCF per day. And so one must question what happens to price and volatility in that time frame. My belief is we'll be in good shape. But the volatility issue is something we've got to consider, which leads me to point number five. And that is what we've got to make sure is that there is a financial regime in place for the natural gas producers to have sufficient financial integrity themselves to support long-term price and volume management. That is long-term financial contracts, derivatives, whatever you call it. Right now, that market doesn't exist well in America. And for companies like mine to insulate my customers from price and volume swings, to take the volatility out, which is bad for manufacturing, bad for the 48% of the families that make 40,000 bucks or less, we've got to be able to figure out a way to hedge long-term gas price and volume. So those are the five issues you've got to concern yourselves with, right? Environmental aspects associated with fracking, infrastructure build-out, exporting, demand curve shift, long-term contracting. We can do that. Natural gas is important. But it is not the only bet you should make. 
And of course, you guys are emblematic of that. It's funny, I gotta tell you a story. Now, you're probably all gonna run out of the room when I tell you this story in short Southern Company stock. But, so a lot of my kind of personal investments are tied up in Southern Company stock, but I have some stuff on the side. I have a 24-year-old son, I actually have two boys, but my 24-year-old is like a genius investor. He's like really, but of course he thinks he's a genius in everything. I just gave him all my money to invest. Now you're like, what? And he's brilliant. He's a great kid. And he's done very well for my family. And as goofy as 24-year-olds are, even he would say that you just don't put all your eggs in one basket from an investing standpoint, right? Right? He used to love Apple, and now he loves Netflix. But he spreads it around. Don't we have to do that with our energy portfolio in America? Of course. In fact, I'm very proud to say that Southern Company is the only company in America today actively investing in every one of these sectors. $20 billion creating a quarter of a million jobs. So let's fill out the rest of the sector. So I started with natural gas. The second thing I want to go to is renewables. Southern Company has made big bets in renewables here recently. You talk about strange bedfellows. One of our great joint venture partners in renewables is none other than Ted Turner. Now, he's a riot to deal with day to day. When I think about renewables outside the southeast, and he's a friend of mine, by the way. He, he loves to get kitted because he'll kit right back with a sledgehammer. When I think about, uh, he, he invests in about 10% of everything we invest in, so we're kind of the 90% investor. He's the 10% side. And we started on his land in New Mexico, and we've expanded, like I said, to Nevada and to California and the Carolinas and some other things. I'm particularly a fan of solar in that area because it's more applicable to the southeast. We just don't get big wind flows in the southeast, certainly not like what you have up here. So we've not been very long in wind, although we procure wind. And in fact, over the past year or so, we've added something like 1,200 megawatts of solar when uh, you're right, biomass, we run the nation's largest biomass facility for the benefit of the citizens of Austin, Texas. It's the world's largest bubbling bed technology application in that space. We have the largest uh, voluntary solar program in Georgia in the United States. Look, I'm all in on renewables. It's important for America. Prices are coming down. It's an exciting area. But here again, when people try to tell you that renewables are the solution and we can do renewables and we can do energy efficiency and you don't need natural gas and oil and coal and nuclear, they're crazy. Three things you've got to consider with renewables, and I know you guys are struggling with some of these issues. One is the fact that renewables are generally located with scarce population areas. So you want to rely on transmission systems to move the wind resource in the form of energy to wherever people will consume it, okay? That provides a certain set of issues. When you build big transmission systems to do long interstate hauls of energy, that's not the best industry structure. Of course it works in areas. But it's not a nationwide kind of design for electricity structure that you want to see. If we learned anything from the blackouts in the Midwest and the Northeast and the desert Southwest here recently, I get interstate transmission is important, but let's not over-rely on that. Number two, intermittent resources. You guys get that, although I guess the wind blows here 100% of the time. I don't know. But what do you do when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine? And what you do then is you've got to have backup generation, right? So backup generation that will follow intermittent resources is most likely gas. So you're doubling down your bet on natural gas. The third point is probably the most controversial, but when I get to my third point here in terms of national financial integrity, I think you'll see why I say this. The renewables industry in America today, primarily wind and solar, and I invest in it and we take advantage of it, is based on tax credits. Energy Information Administration put out a study not long ago that looks at the kind of per unit of energy tax preference intensity, if you will. Wind and solar get about the 100 times per unit, per barrel of oil, per BTU, or whatever you want to say, 100 times the tax preference items than do 
oil, coal, and natural gas, and 35 times the intensity of nuclear. My question to you is, how long can the United States government afford to do that? The third area of the portfolio is energy efficiency. Now, here's something I want to be very clear about. Here again, when I think about the families we serve and their desire to raise their standard of living, in raising their standard of living, living in a better place, eating better, better medical, care, better medical care, education, everything else, they will use more energy. We should be proud of that. And if you look around the world, when we look at some places that desperately need economic development, they will use more energy. That's a good thing. Let's not be ashamed of selling more of our product. Here's my belief. Very often, energy efficiency gets translated into use less. I would rather you adopt this idea. In order to be good stewards, and we all want to do that, we want to be good stewards of every resource we consume, we should use less where we can. But in order to foster a better living for people, we should use more where we should. Energy efficiency is important to Southern Company. We've been barked on lots of different kind of strategies to do that. We've shaved off about 4,000 megawatts. We're about, I don't know, when you consider our competitive generation business, 50,000 megawatt kind of generating capacity. We've shaved off about 4,000 megawatts in the last 10 years or so through energy efficiency. From an energy consumption standpoint, since 2010, I think we've reduced energy consumption about 1.6 billion kilowatt hours. That's about the annual energy consumption of, of Birmingham and uh, Savannah, Georgia combined. It'd be about half the energy, I think, consumption of North Dakota. So we're doing a lot. I'm all in favor of it. But the idea that America should consume less energy, I think, is a bit misguided. In order to grow economically, we should be proud to figure out ways to sell more. Let's just do it wisely. So those are the first three, natural gas, renewables, energy efficiency. Let's turn now to nuclear. So Southern Company is proud to lead the way, I think, in the renaissance of the nuclear industry in America, and I can tell you it is challenged. I get the question all the time, how in the world can you justify building a $14 billion nuclear plant that takes 10 years to build with energy prices being what they are today? Well, if you look at history, there is no clear predictor that today's price, or the price three years from now, will be replicated in the future. I think nuclear is another dominant solution for America. It is emissionless. It is safe. Clean, safe, reliable, affordable, nuclear is there. Now, I can't talk about nuclear without starting with Fukushima, and in fact, I can give the administration and Congress great marks, so I don't mean to criticize all the time, for being resolute in their support of nuclear in America. And I can remember when Fukushima hit, uh, there was the earthquake, and it was a Friday, and um, I got my board on the phone, said something important is going on now, pay attention, and then the tsunami hit. And that's really when everything went bad, because when, when, when the earthquake hit, the units tripped off. Okay. The tsunami took out all the external power resources. And because the diesel generators were exposed and were taken out of service, there was no way to get the water where it needed to be because all the pumps and everything else were destroyed. And that's where they got into trouble. When I think about our ability to help the Japanese nation, I think I'm really proud of this industry and its response. Because I can assure you in the United States, we have a terrific track record in nuclear. We get up in the morning thinking about safety. We go to bed at night thinking about safety. We have a terrific track record. And I think with the innovations that we're going forward with in America today, as demonstrated as what we're building at Plant Vogel, south of Augusta, Georgia, creating tax base and jobs, 
it's really positive. Let me just give you what's different about Vogel. Number one, it is not near any coastline. It's 130 miles inland, 220 feet above sea level. And we've even evaluated kind of crazy circumstances like for the river that runs by Vogel. We've evaluated the effects of essentially taking out all three dams upriver, having a hurricane come through at the same time, and we're still fine. Number two, we're not in a seismic sensitive area. The southeast is essentially sand and mud. So we don't have underground volcanoes. That's a good thing. And then number three is the technology that we're putting in place at Plant Vogel is called the Westinghouse AP1000 technology. AP stands for advanced passive. So I just happen to have two coffee cups here. So this was the reactor. There's my coffee in there. The water in the design sits on top of the reactor basically just like that. So in the event of a catastrophe, the water essentially just drops right into the reactor where it needs to be. No need for external power sources. It is the safest, cleanest, most reliable energy resource in, Amer in, in the world today. And so we're proud to go forward on that. We're the 45.7% owner. There are other part owners, uh, Oglethorpe, Oglethorpe Cooperative Utilities, MEAG, Municipal Electric Authority of Georgia, and a city of Dalton, Georgia. We're working together cooperatively to make that a reality. It's going to be something we're exceedingly proud of for years to come. No volatility out of that resource either. The gas equivalent price will be about a buck per million BTU. So it will have a place in energy dispatch for decades to come. The... Uh, the uh, final part of the portfolio is coal. And I know there was excitement about shale gas and shale oil and all that stuff. I'm afraid coal is getting left out of the conversation these days. And there's more and more actions being taken, I think, to burden coal's ability to serve this nation well. For so long, it's represented around 50% of our electricity production. Now it's down to about 40. I remember when um, the latest... Uh, environmental regulations came out of EPA uh, when they were, it was originally called HAPS MACT and now it's uh, MATS I guess is the name of it, they've changed the name. Um, I remember testifying before Congress and there were some EPA folks there. EPA originally estimated we would only shut down 10,000 megawatts across the United States of coal. I testified that I thought it'd be more like 70. I think we're 70 and I bet you we're heading north. That's not good for America. You know, the United States has 27% of the world's coal reserves, and they're darn good reserves. And so Southern Company Forever has always been committed to finding kind of solutions, not engage in rhetoric about finding ways to make sure that from an energy innovation standpoint, we can continue to use this important resource. And we've done that, we think, with our Kemper County project in Mississippi. Let me just tell you a bit about that. It is... Uh, Southern Company is the only company in America today in my industry that does proprietary, robust research and development. Wilsonville, Alabama is where we're headquartered. We developed our own technology along with a partner of ours, Kellogg Brown Root, where we will gasify native Mississippi lignite, otherwise goes unused. We'll gasify it. We create a synthesis gas. We put filters on the synthesis gas. We capture 65% of the CO2. CO2 is not a waste. It has tremendous value in enhanced oil recovery. We have two long-term contracts with Denberry and TELUS, and they will pay us for the CO2 indexed to the price of oil. It has tremendous value. And imagine this, sports fans. Using a resource that otherwise goes unused, and I know you have some interest in lignite up here, we can create more electricity more domestic oil, think national security. We can create tax base and jobs. The energy coming out of Kemper County has the equivalent at about a $90 per barrel of oil basis of about a buck and a quarter per million BTU. Now, we have had our challenges. The capital cost, when we originally entered into the agreement with Mississippi, the state of Mississippi, to build Kemper, we entered into a fixed price with only 10% of the engineering done, only 6.7% um, contingency. 
It was woefully inadequate. It's been a bitter pill to swallow. Southern Company has written off. We just volunteered to do it. We didn't even ask the commission for any help here. About $990 million. So among friends, let's call that a billion dollars. That's a very bitter pill to swallow. But my sense is this is an important step. Sometimes when you innovate and sometimes when you take steps out there, it takes vision, it takes courage, and along the way you may run into some bumps. But we are resolute in the idea that we've got to find a way forward for coal, that CO2 is a resource, is not a waste, but has value, and we've got to find a way to demonstrate it. Now, hopefully there will be some other value-enhancing things that come out of the Kemper Project. For the, for the economics, we have fixed for the citizens of Mississippi. There are other projects we're looking at. We're doing one in China, India, Poland, other applications across the United States. We've got to get the capital cost down. But this is an idea that I think has merit. I think it's important. And we're continuing to innovate in our R&D facilities around this technology to where now... We're not going to capture just 65%. We're looking at ideas to capture 100% of the CO2. These are important ideas. It is important for America to preserve and value its resource of coal, whether we consume it here or send it overseas. But my view is we've got to do both. We cannot ignore the workhorses of nuclear and coal in this nation's energy portfolio. So that's the portfolio idea. We need them all. And we can do it in America, and I'm proud to say that we're demonstrating we can do it. The second part of this electricity strategy really goes to the idea of energy innovation. Now, when I talk about energy innovation, I think a lot of people go to some pictures in your mind about maybe electric vehicles or smart meters. What I always like to do is, is start at the beginning and to say this. When you start with energy innovation, what we really do is kind of make move, and sell, and then finally consume energy, right? The innovation cycle has to move along all of those segments. So, so clearly, the directional drilling is part of the make side. In my view, in the electricity side, it's converting a fuel stock into an electron. And we're continuing to innovate and have for years, to come, for years in the past and will for years to come, improving things like heat rates to get geeky about it. In terms of moving electricity, we're continuing to innovate in terms of looking at, especially information technology-based solutions, to understand where the problems may occur in transmission lines before they arise. Now, I've got to tell you a funny story um, about smart meters. Now, that was always kind of the sexy topic, right? We've deployed now 4.4 million smart meters across the Southeast, one of the leaders in the United States. And it's really interesting. I, one of my careers, in fact, uh, the governor mentioned, or no, Senator Hoven mentioned, that I had 15 different jobs. One of my jobs was CIO for Southern. Now, you know what CIO stands for, right? CIO, Chief Information Officer. I, I thought many days it stood for career is over. <laughs> I also chair for my industry the cyber terrorism task force. I can tell you America is challenged every day with people that don't have our interests at heart. FERC does a great job thinking about the reliability and sanctity of the electric network. It's one of your primary charges. We worry about it all the time too. And it's easy to think about, I think, clearly the physical threats, Hurricane Sandy, the way we responded to Katrina. You know, Katrina, Mississippi, a little company, of course, they brought the whole resources of Southern Company to bear, plus our friends across the United States. We got the power on, anybody could take power in 12 days. This nation can respond to physical threats very well. The great untold story is what's going on out there day to day on the cyber realm. And it's something that we're very vigilant about. We've got to make that a primary emphasis as we think about innovation and turning on and unlocking the value of smart meters and smart homes and everything else. I want to make sure that we protect the gate. 
that people aren't able to get into the electric network or access our customer proprietary information. These are important issues. There's other interesting stuff. I, I love the idea of electric vehicles. You know, right now, I guess for us, electric vehicles are, depending on where you are in the United States, can fill up on a per gallon basis, the equivalent of 60 cents to a buck per gallon. And right now, we're increasing the range of those vehicles. It's another exciting way. And when you consider not just electric vehicles, what's the other consumption? Why is electricity consumption going so fast? It's all our goofy devices. Here's your little Apple uh, thingamajiggy there. What about your little iPhones, right? And your iPads and your, all that stuff. I'm telling you, electricity is the energy resource of the future. Really interesting stuff. One more interesting innovation that I'm really a fan of, and I think some people in my industry view this as a threat, is distributed generation. Now let's go back to renewables. Particularly for solar, I think it may make sense one day, let's evaluate the economics X tax credits, where you may put a solar panel on your roof. Therefore, you eliminate the problem of long haul transmission. You create some other problems along the way. It's an idea that, at least in the Southeast, economically doesn't make sense yet. But I can tell you with any strategy, I always talk about we've got to have elements of defense, but we've also got to have elements of offense. And our whole business model is predicated on the notion of having customers in the middle of everything we do. And we define our effect on customers by providing the best price, the best reliability, and the best customer service we can. We're an integrated, regulated utility. We're responsible throughout the value chain for that. It's one of the advantages integrated, regulated utilities have, like you have here in North Dakota, relative to the so-called organized markets and the deregulated parts of the United States. It's not so clear there. Distributed generation is something that may come, but there are some aspects of it, and this is kind of innovation in terms of how we employ this technology, we've got to keep in mind. We've got to have common sense applications. In other words, the value of the energy you produce in a distributed generation way, maybe it's a solar panel, should be priced at your avoided cost. Number two, when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, when the sun doesn't shine, you want to have a connection to the network. In fact, it was funny, in my last annual meeting, I had a guy stand up, he's a great guy, his name is Sam Boo, he's a wonderful person. He says, I'm so proud of my solar panel in my house, and do you know, during a thunderstorm recently, it still produced 60% of the energy it was supposed to. And I felt like saying, well, what 40% of your house do you want me to turn off? They need backup generation. They need access to the network, they need backup generation. Early adopters of distributed generation are largely those people that are most affluent among our customers. If we don't price it correctly, network, backup generation, the less affluent will pay for and subsidize the more affluent, and that's not right. If we send the right price signals, if we price it correctly, distributed generation is a great thing for America. Let me turn now to the third point, and that is this whole idea of restore America's financial integrity. Here again, it sounds highfalutin. Why? Our industry, your energy industry, is some of the most capital intensive things going on in America today, in the world today. My industry spends about uh, $90 billion a year in CapEx. Southern Company spends about five and a half, six billion a year ourselves. We need to make a bet like a nuclear plant or any coal plant or any long haul transmission. We need long-term, stable, reliable financial markets. And I'm afraid where we're going right now, when you look at the volatility being created by this discussion we're having about whether we're going to pay our own national debt, we're creating risk that this country doesn't need. It doesn't support a sustainable, reliable standard, gold standard, if you will, for the world's financial markets. When I think about the role of energy policy right now, why I'm so kind of imbued with the spirit of promoting what you're doing here in North Dakota across the United States. Congress has to act. We can't let people that don't have the capability to understand the full portfolio of responsibility, clean, safe, reliable, affordable, wrest the control away from Congress. 
Congress is the only entity in Washington, in my view, that has the right lens to balance sometimes those competing alternatives. And I would argue right now, a lot of energy policy is being set out of EPA. And I don't believe they have the capability, for all the good intentions, I don't believe they have the capability to assess that full responsibility portfolio that I talk about. The second thing that is just obvious to me is we've got to fix the debt. If we don't, we all know we have unescapably higher taxes, higher interest rates, reduced growth, a worse life for our children and their children. We've got to get it. Whether you're Republican or Democrat, those are not your issues. These are inherently American issues. Everybody gets that. And whether you believe you've got to cut costs, of course we do. Think about the tough kitchen table economic decisions that these families make across the, the southeast and the upper plains. They make them every day. Why can't we? Whether you think you need to raise taxes, I don't. I think we need to reshape taxes for sure. That's point number three I'll get to in a sec. We've got to promote economic policies at the same time while we deal with the debt we're going to produce growth. We've got to grow the economy. That's going to be the way that we solve our debt crisis. You're demonstrating that here in North Dakota. Third area is tax policy. I talk a lot about this, and I don't mean to get too geeky with you in the morning, but it's something we got to do. Uh, I guest hosted Squawk Box one day, and for the first time I went out there and kind of got out on a limb, but I swear that was now some time ago. The math is still true, and I work at the Business Roundtable for Broad Industry, and I'm going to give you some math that is true for Southern Company we would be willing to do that is also true for the electric utility industry that is also true for industrial America. And I will tell you that this math, while it is true for these broad constituents, is a little controversial because within those constituents there are winners and losers. When I think about the kind of work that's going on right now with Bacchus and Camp, starting with a clean sheet of paper, they're approaching it the right way. Here's what I would promote. Southern Company takes advantage of a lot of tax benefits. We're so capital intensive. Listen, I love the stuff. I love it as much as anybody else does. But I'd be willing to make this trade. I'll give away all forward-looking tax preference items. I want to keep what I got because I made economic decisions based on what was offered. And I want to keep something geeky called normalization, which allows me to flow through tax benefits in a sensible way back to my customers. But I'll give away all access to accelerated depreciation through, through bonus depreciation, investment tax credits, production tax credits, alternate fuels credits, thigh bone meets the knee bone, you name it. There's a million of these things out there that people are frankly addicted to. Give them all away in exchange for a 25% corporate income tax rate fixed for some period of time. It simplifies the tax code. It gets tax policy out of making good, sound business decisions. That's something America desperately needs. And we've got to find a way to repatriate cash and continue to create jobs. This is not just a domestic issue. This is an international competitiveness issue. We need tax policy, comprehensive tax reform, badly. A lot of people are waiting for the moment. And when I think about the moments we're facing right now with this great duress in Washington, maybe I'm optimistic. But there is a chance for us to come together in this time of crisis and promote a grand bargain, whether it's about tax policy or doing something about the deficit or even an environment in which we can get something done on national energy security. It's a big deal. Now, I know I sound kind of passionate to you, and I apologize if I get a little overboard, but I love this stuff. And I think when you look at the potential and what you see here in North Dakota, of what it can mean for America, what it can mean for our future, economic growth and jobs and personal income, national security, economic security, the advantages of what we can do as a nation put us in a position we haven't been in my lifetime and decades before. The benefits of what I'm arguing for are so positive and so overwhelming as leaders of the enterprise, however you touch your constituent groups, 
We need to be for this. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here with you. I would love to take questions and answers. <clears throat> Who wants to chat? Back there. Uh, we'll just yell. <laughs> in uh, Minot, we're a big investor in the state here. Yep. Uh, conceptually, agree with everything you say. Right. Uh, both as a businessman and a um, individual. What goes through my mind, though, is that how do we make it happen? Yeah. Uh, look, I get that all the time. Um, so. You get folks like me that try and have this, uh, you know, I don't know, Jeannie Wolak from our Washington office is here. Where's Jeannie? She's over there. We, we have a, a really important, effective Washington presence. We make it our business to try and influence policy for the good of America. See, in my business, we have the blessing of confluence of if it's good for America, good for the economy, it's good for our business. We get to sell more stuff if the economy grows. So not only am I representing, I think, American interests when I come visit folks like you or whatever I do in Washington, I also have the wonderful kind of confluence of representing my own company's interests. See, but it, it was interesting. Um, I'm, a, I'm a friend with Frank Luntz. If any of you all know Frank Luntz, the pollster, and he does words and all that. I was on a phone conference with him yesterday talking about this. And... It's funny, we have this, we have, if y'all ever want it, I wrote a little book called Leadership Perspectives. It's a little tiny thing, and whoever organized me coming here, I'll get you whatever copies you want. I'll just send them up here. But there's lots of uh, dogma in this book. It talks about leadership and some of the things we stand for. And please understand when I say these things, they are, I am not meant to say that my values are right. It really just gives us an opportunity to have a conversation about our values and what we stand for as leaders in our enterprise and our communities. And some of the concepts in there are really pretty simple. I think you guys would get it. It's that we've got to be bigger than our own bottom line. That we've got to make sure that the communities are better off because we're there. We've got to be good citizens wherever we serve. Being a citizen means rising above your parochial interest. And what we've got to do is find ways to engage. When I was talking with Frank Luntz yesterday, he was so frustrated at this, this frozen circumstance in Washington. And, you know, what's the old Chinese saying, out of chaos comes opportunity? Was it Wang Zhe? Something like that. We may be at one of those moments. The United States cannot continue to have this divisive relationship. Something will unfreeze eventually because this is not sustainable. This is not the way to run our government. And as we unfreeze, we got to make sure that if this isn't the way, what is? That we make sure that we get those arguments out in public discourse. And this is where I think things like the Business Roundtable, the United States Chamber of Commerce, governors associations can be that third rail that can talk common sense to the American public and get our politicians to do the right thing. It's too easy to say it'll never work and to adopt a cynical attitude here. We can't afford that as a nation. That's not what made us great. So my hope is it's opportunities like these where we can step into the breach and find a way forward. So I'm committed to helping there. Who's next? Someone right here. And look, you've got great leadership. Hoven, Heidkamp, Governor Downrimple. I mean, you guys are doing the right stuff. Yes, sir. With, the, with EPA, we agree fully that EPA is doing more energy policy than Congress is. But the way we're seeing to move EPA is with coalitions going together. Now, we think that the EPA is listening a lot to what's going on, on the East Coast. And we think that there's going to be a need to have an energy state 
look or opinion going forward. I don't think we do that individually. North Dakota can go there and talk to EPA. Southern Company can go there and talk. But if you've got regional utilities together, isn't it possible to bring states together, energy states, the high energy states, such as Wyoming, yep. Mississippi, and that, to do that? Would Southern Company be willing to look at joining that type of coalition and taking that message forward? Sure. Look, we're, we're, uh, we look for any way to be effective, okay? So we have lots of kind of side coalitions to advance the right causes for America. We do that all the time. Let me give you one more principle, and you were kind of hitting at it. In my view, we shouldn't look for single government, one-size-fits-all solutions to our future. What we want is government to be an enabler and push decisions down to the lowest practical level, whether that's a regional solution or a single state solution. That's typically where I end up on a lot of arguments. I remember when the United States was, the EPA, or I forget who it was, was deciding on should we have a RPS, one-size-fits-all. Doesn't make any sense at all. And in fact, EPRI, which is in my industry, it's an electric uh, research and development co-op. I don't mean to diminish it. I was the vice chair of EPRI. The current chair of EPRI is a woman that works for Southern Company. The former CEO of EPRI is on my board, Dr. Steven Specker. I love EPRI. EPRI came out with a response to, remember some, it was a failed legislation, Waxman Markey, that was going to produce uh, something like 80% carbon reductions by 2050. And they came out with something called PRISM, which essentially took into account the full portfolio, and this is how we're going to make it work. Well, the unfortunate problem was PRISM didn't work for all regions of the United States. And so they came out with something later called PRISM 2.0, probably spent thousands of dollars marketing that idea. And PRISM 2.0 was actually a good step in the right direction. And it started saying there may be regional solutions that make sense. For example, here in the Upper Plains. Wind resources are plentiful, let's take advantage of them. In the southeast, nuclear, coal may make sense. Let's figure out ways to lead on carbon capture and storage. And that's why we've been so kind of out there. Southern Company is the only company today doing carbon capture research on storage from an electricity generation standpoint. We run the DOE's Carbon Capture Research Center in Alabama. We capture carbon from a post-combustion basis at Plant Barry, pre-combustion basis at Plant um, Kemper County, Plant Radcliffe. So look, anywhere we can, what we got to do is figure out the right coalitions, the right solutions to bring the right policy to bear at the right time. Uh, I think we're very active. We'll be committed to help however we can. That's one of the reasons why I'm here. And here again, all I'm doing is extolling your virtue. You guys are the leaders in America for the right kind of energy hub concept. What I want to do is leverage what you're doing across the United States. We what probably else? have time for one more quick question. One more quick question. No? Oh, yes, okay. no, yes, no, yes, no. Yes. Oh, if you could just wait for the mic. We're streaming live for students across North Dakota. Jeremy Doctor, Expansion Energy. One thing I didn't hear you talk about is a role for power storage, particularly utility scale power storage, as part of the generation and distribution mix. And I'm you bet. curious about your policy views personally and as Southern companies, how that can fit in, what policies you might support for resource and economic efficiency. Okay, so great question. Power storage is kind of like the Rosetta Stone. I mean, it's the thing that can unlock a whole new industry. Because right now you can't store electricity. You gotta consume it as you produce it. And one of the big challenges we have is balancing consumption and generation at the same time, especially with intermittent resources. And so one of the solutions is advance the idea of energy storage. All for that. In fact, part of our big research and development effort at EPRI and also proprietary is advancing things like battery storage and flywheels and a variety of other things. And people have been looking at that forever. We joke kind of at Southern, uh, this is really about fuel cells. One of our senior execs has been promoting fuel cells. He says in three years they'll be here. He's been saying it for 25 years. <laughs> I am all in on developing ways to figure out and crack that nut. Let me give you one of our kind of cool ideas. And we're looking at a variety of things here. But here's a cool idea. 
Energy storage for something as big as Southern Company or, you know, the United States, you've got to do it at scale. And one of the problems we have is scale solutions for storage. Well, let's get off the idea of thinking storage as a battery. Let's think about the earth as a battery. Texas produces too much wind. In fact, they produce so much wind, and the wind blows in either the shoulder parts of the day or at night, that sometimes they have negatively priced energy. So one of the ideas we're thinking about is, huh, you mean they pay us to take it? Okay, that sounds like good business. Why don't we think about the kind of geology where we have this blessing of EOR? Let's do K's, compressed air energy storage. And let's take negatively priced wind energy at night. Let's push air in the ground at night and compress it at super high volumes. And then let's extract it at peak parts of the day. Now something that has almost no capacity value, wind, now has tremendous capacity value, either for four or six hour strips at peak parts of the day. And when you think about the kind of geology we're sitting on, using the earth as a battery, you can do that at scale. So that's one of the applications we're looking at. The other kind of more tried and true is pump storage hydro, same deal. You have a storage facility kind of in a mountain or in a hill or something. You pump it out during the day and you pump it back up at night, same concept. But K's, C-A-E-S, is a compressed air energy storage is another way to do that. It's a super important development. Well, I guess that's it, huh? You're going to yank me off the stage. Hey, look, let me just say this. I traveled from Atlanta to be here, and I can tell you I was thrilled to do it. The kind of leadership you have in this state with your governor, with your senators, the kind of leadership your regulators have here, the kind of folks we're able to put on the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission with Tony Clark, you guys got it going. And what I want to do is leverage the kind of experience you have here and the capability you have here to be a model for America. It has been an absolute honor for me to join you here this morning. Thank you very much.